Let's pray together. Father, we come before you humbled and grateful that you will never forsake us. When we come to faith in Christ, Lord, that our faith is secure in you and that you will never leave us. You love us and you care for us. That Jesus has redeemed us. And we pray, Father, that your love for us would embolden us with a love for you. That you would put your image on our hearts. That you would let us stay on the path of following you. That we would obey you with every ounce of our being, that we would walk in in complete obedience to your will. And so, Father, we stand before you knowing that the challenges and the trials are coming our way, and that we are often tempted to wander and to be swayed by the things around us. And we pray, Father, that you would sustain us, that anything that keeps us from you would be taken away by you. And, Lord, that you would give us courage for that battle. Now you give us courage to live for you, to endure for you, to point others to you, and that the way that we live out our courage in Christ would be appealing to the people around us, that they would see a courage that can only come from you. So Lord, may that be said of us today. If we know Christ, that we can have courage with Christ, and you want to use that. So, Father, we ask that you would pray, or that you would speak to us from your words. That's what we pray, Father. Speak to us from your word, the word that you have spoken. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. This time, the first through third graders, if you would like to go to your classrooms, you can. You can follow your teachers downstairs out the back. Uh, Also, I want to mention, if you're visiting with us, we would love to uh, find out a little bit more about you and how we can minister to you and serve you. Um, and how you can be a part of what's going on here at Safe Harbor. So there should be a Connect card in front of you on the chairs in front of you. We would love to, um, to, for you to turn that in at the end of the service in the offering plate so that we could touch base with you and, and pray for you. If you have any prayer requests, we would love to pray for you as well. You can fill that out. Also, if you're not on the church email list and you would like to be or you're not in the, the church kind of private Facebook page and you would like to be, uh, just let us know. You can mark on that card that you would like to be added. We want to make sure that we uh, have you on there if you want to be, and so you can keep up with some of the things that are going on uh, here in the church. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, just leave them open, Acts 21 and 22. We, we work our way through passages of the Bible here. We believe that God's Word speaks. All right, what we all need to hear today is not something that I come up with in my own minds. And we need to hear something that God has spoken And God still speaks to us today, and so we work our way through passages of the Bible. And so as we read and have heard this this story read, I want us to to think about the fact that we all have a story. We all have a story. Our life, your life, is a story. How your life began. You can think back with me as as we go through our stories in our minds, how your life began, influences that shaped you. Growing up to today, decisions you made, good or bad, and the impact that that had on your life, and the way that you live right now is part of your story, and where you are, where you find yourself today, the things you're facing, the joys that are in life, and the challenges that are in front of you. If you're a Christian today, if you would say that you know Jesus today, your story has been shaped by God. And what he has done in you. And you know that. Well, all of our stories have been shaped by God in some way. But we as Christians know that God is shaping our story right now. You have a story of a life before you knew Jesus. And what that looked like. You have a story about a time when you came to know who he was. And it was put into your heart that you loved him. And you have a story of what your life looks like with Christ now in your life. Every Christian story is in some way similar, but it's also in some way different. Like we all came to Christ in different ways at different times through different people. But we are similar in the fact that every single one of us in Christ, our testimony, our story is a story of being saved simply by God's grace, His grace alone. Nothing that we have earned or deserved 
that we have been plucked from the fire of His judgment that we deserved and given life and grace. And this is the story of all of us if we are in Christ. And that change in your life that has occurred, what you've become by the grace of God, is a great witness to who God is. It is a defense of your faith. So today we are starting a, a new sermon series uh, called Finish Well. We're working our way through the book of Acts, and the last chapters of Acts is all about Paul finishing his life. And we're going to see that Paul faces a lot of difficult things, and yet he is going to finish well. And my prayer is for each one of us, wherever we find ourselves today, wherever we are in our life, that from this moment on, that we would finish well. That we would finish well with Christ at the center of our lives. So we're going to see Paul really on this, this final journey to his final destination in Rome. That's, everything's going to be working up towards him going to Rome, the capital of the empire, and he's going to go there as a prisoner. It doesn't seem like that's finishing well, but he will. And part of finishing well, the, what we're going to see today as we begin the series is a, is a gospel courage. A courage that only comes from Christ in living our life. And that's what I want us to think about, is that God wants you to have a contagious courage. He wants you to have a contagious courage in telling your story. In telling the story of what Jesus has done in you. And so for some of us today, we come here and we realize, well, Jesus hasn't done anything in my life. And so the starting point then would be to come to a realization of who Christ is and invite him into your life. That's where it starts. But for some of us, we know we have a story with Christ already in it. And Jesus wants us to live out that story with contagious courage. The Apostle Paul had quite a story. If you've read the Bible at all, Paul, as we've seen through the book of Acts, we know that he was born a devout Jew. He was a Jewish man who was raised and taught according to all these Jewish traditions and the Jewish laws. He fought in a lot of ways to preserve that, that life, uh, guarding uh, their, their way of life and the God that they followed, the God they believed in, including uh, persecuting and killing Christians who uh, were coming against them, who were Jewish, but now they were changing. But God, in the middle of all that, broke through Paul's life and changed him. He was a changed man. And some of us here today know, hey, we need to be changed. And Paul needed to be changed, and he didn't even realize it. And God broke through and changed his life. And he became a missionary who suffered for the very Christ that he was persecuting and attacking. So his story is a compelling story. What would happen to a man to cause this? And that's what we're going to see him recount today. What happened to him? We left off last week in Acts 21. He had gone back to Jerusalem, even though he'd been warned, don't go back there, it's not going to end well. And he was in the, the temple area worshiping God in Christ when he was recognized by some Jewish people who had come into Jerusalem from, from Asia and Europe to worship uh, at this festival. And they recognized who Paul was. He had been traveling in their neck of the woods and he'd been causing quite a stir by telling people about Jesus and the Jewish people were being converted in those places. So they recognized Paul and who he was and they falsely accused him. They spoke things about him that simply weren't true. Accused him of uh, basically bringing people into the temple that weren't supposed to be there. People who weren't Jewish. And so they accused him of these crimes. A riot erupts and he narrowly escapes by the Roman authorities basically intervening and trying to break up a riot. So they've got, they take Paul in custody and they're, what do we do? All right, what do we do with this guy? We don't even know who he is and, and yet all these people are mad at him. And so we pick up today, he's been taken away from that scene and he's kind of going up to the, the Roman fortress, the barracks where they are. He's been taken into custody. There's a large gathering of Jewish people still around. Uh, a mob of people who've been attacking and Paul we're going to see in just a minute, turns to the Roman commander and asks to speak to this crowd, this crowd that hates him with every fiber of their being. They hate this man. And so our text shows Paul living out a kind of courage that Christ gives. And a kind of courage 
that Christ can use. It appeals to people. Paul lived this way. His whole life was about this. And that's why he was so effective in helping people come to know who God truly was and who Christ was and what Christ had done for them and why people were receptive and wanted to hear from him. So are you today, as we think about Paul and the courage that he has, are you, first of all, courageous in your faith? Would you say, yeah, I am pretty bold in living for Jesus, and other people know that about me. That's who I am. And if, if that's who you are, would you say that the kind of courage that you have is appealing to people? Or do you just come off like a jerk? There's some pretty people that are courageous in their faith, and people don't want to have anything to do with because they're just jerks. So what kind of courage do you have? And is it appealing to people around you? What, is, what does that look like? What does God want us to look like in Christ as we are bold for him? And this kind of courage that shares Jesus and promotes that, hey, this is somebody you should look into and you should know yourself instead of pushing people away. Well, the first thing we see is that Paul exhibited calmness. Paul exhibited calmness. Paul in, is in the middle of the fire right here. He's being falsely accused. He's being slandered, talked about in ways that aren't true. Facing arrest, facing trial, maybe even death. And he's calm. Like, would you be calm? Is that you? Like, they're, they're taking you away uh, uh, under the, the custody of the authorities, and you haven't done anything? Would you be calm? Look at verse 37. As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, Am I allowed to say something to you? And this, this is mind-boggling to me. Here he is, this Roman commander, got him in cuffs or whatever. Paul just turns to him, Hey, uh, am I allowed to talk to you? Like, politely, am I allowed to talk to you? Or do I need to be quiet? Uh, and, and so he's calm, collected. He replied, you know how to speak Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt some time ago and led 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness? And to be clear, that's not Paul. And so this man is all confused about who he has in his custody. He doesn't even know. Right? So there's all these misconceptions about who, who Paul is and what he's done, all these misunderstandings. And so Paul, again, calmly replies, verse 39, Paul said, I'm a Jewish man. I'm not Egyptian. I'm a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. He's a Roman citizen. Tarsus was a, an educated city, an important city in the empire. So people from there were, were respected. And he says, so, so this is who I really am. Now, can I speak to the people? And so verse 40, the man gives, sees, well, this guy isn't who I thought he was. So I guess I'll let him go ahead and talk. Verse 40, after he had given permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in Aramaic. Your, your translation may say Hebrew, which is basically Hebrew and Aramaic are similar dialects. They're the, the local language of the people in Israel. And he says this, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Aramaic, in their language, they became even quieter. So here we see Paul calmly steps up, this crowd that hates him. He gets their attention by waving his hand, calms the crowd. The crowd becomes more silent as he start, they start hearing him in their language. Like, he's, he's one of us. Right? He's talking to us. Rather than Greek, which is the official Roman language. And so if somebody wants to impress the authorities, they're going to talk in Greek. Paul wasn't trying to impress the authorities, even though they had him in custody. He was trying to talk to the people. He wanted them to hear him. And the man that these people considered an enemy to their traditions, to their way of life, was speaking to them on their terms, meeting them where they were. And so they listened. And so Paul, we see here, is doing everything he can to build a rapport, to build a good reputation with this crowd. He diffused an angry situation and showed that he was not an enemy but a friend. He was their friend. He didn't want to, to cause trouble for them. He spoke their language. He spoke with respect to them. He actually addressed them as brothers and fathers. 
And he meant that. They, he saw them as family. They had the same ancestral background. They, these were his cousins and brothers and fathers. It was a genuine statement. He was not some foreigner who had come in to try to upset things. That's not what Paul was about. And so Paul was trying to show them, listen, I'm one of you. I have your best interest in mind. I, I love you. I care about you. Listen to me. And so there's a lesson in this example. And we can learn from Paul's calmness in a situation that could be anything but calm. When people are bad-mouthing us, when people are saying things about us that aren't true, when people, we feel like people are attacking us for our faith or, or something like that, Paul, like, like Paul, we can be calm and gentle compassionate and reason with people. We will never give a good witness for Christ if we begin with arrogance or anger. We simply won't. By, we, we, or offending them with an attitude of superiority. Like, come on guys, you don't, you don't know this stuff? I want to emphasize that, that salvation is by Christ alone. It is His work. It is of the Lord. It is His doing. God accomplishes his work. We can't do that. But we are called to give a witness. And God uses that witness to accomplish his work. And this means we must be serious about bringing people to Christ, to faith in Christ, to, to confronting them with the truth of the gospel of who he is. And so this means we shouldn't address people with an improper attitude of superiority or anger or harshness. That just closes doors. We want people to hear with an open heart. And we don't want to close their hearts before we even can say anything because of the way we're saying it. Also notice here, Paul makes no mention of the charges that he's been wrongly accused of. He doesn't even talk about that. Why is that? I mean, if you had one chance to speak before the crowd, you would say, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. What are you doing? That's not what he says at all. He says, I'm one of you. He knew the real issue with these people in Jerusalem, the people that he had grown up with, was not with him. It was not with him. It was about something much more important than him. It was about the way that they saw God, about the, the way they, they understood who Jesus was and how Jesus changes lives and he changes who we are and it changes how we live. That's what they had the real issue with, even though they didn't even know it. And so he kept calm, knowing, hey, something greater is at stake here. Something greater is at stake than who, who I am and how they see me and what happens to me. Something more important is at stake in what they hear from me and how they perceive Jesus. Their lives are at stake, not just mine. So we see the love that Paul has for these people putting them above himself. And this is a lesson for us. Listen, today we, we hear of attacks on Christianity. We sometimes feel like the culture around us is attacking our beliefs and what we hold dear. And that can ap appear personal. It, it can feel personal. But Paul reminds us we must be calm and don't take these attacks personally. See them as actually attacks on the gospel on Christ and who he is, and not just what we want or how we feel. We are to be more concerned about defending the truth of the gospel than about defending our own reputations. This is what Christ calls us to, defend him more than our own reputations. And so one way our courage in Christ should be profitable to the people around us as we know who Jesus is and we live it, one way that we can make sure that it, it attracts and appeals to other people, is that we remain calm. We don't get in the way. And, and so we see Paul doing that. Another way we maintain courage and conviction in the midst of these challenges is that we never forget. We never forget how God has changed us. That's how we can keep having courage. So some of you today come here and you realize, I am not courageous in my faith at all. <laughs> like, I struggle to, to pray with somebody, much less mention the actual name of Jesus. And I think part of that may be because we have forgot what Jesus has done in us. And Paul didn't forget. 
he never forgot. Paul, in his calm manner, remembers and tells the crowd about his life. He tells the story. He tells his story of what God has done. And we need to remember our stories, who we were. Remember who you were before you came to know Christ. And remember what God did and how he did that and who you are now. Never get over that story of God's grace to you and how you came to faith in Christ by his grace alone. Look at verse 3. Here's what he does. He goes straight into his story. He's still speaking to this crowd, right? He's not saying, I'm innocent. He says, listen to what has happened to me. He continued, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Brought up right here in Jerusalem, guys. I was raised here, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictness of our ancestral law. Listen, I followed the, the law, the Jewish law, the Jewish way of life strictly. That's who I was. He was a Jew, like many of them, who was born in a foreign land, but he was brought to this city and raised and discipled and taught by the, the most famous Jewish leader of the time, Gamaliel. And so he had been brought up to, to live out the Jewish life as best one could. And he had been surrounded by their, these Jewish influences from the time he was a little kid. And, the, and the continuing on, he says, I was zealous for God, just as all of you are today. I was in your shoes. I was exactly where you are right now. That's who I was. I, I can relate to exactly what you're feeling about me because I was there. And so knowing Paul's background, no one could question his Jewishness or his devotion to it. He had a reputation for being serious about what he believed. Verse 4, I persecuted this way, the, the way of Jesus that I'm now living, to the, by, to the death arresting and putting them, both men and women, in jail as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. Just, just go ask these guys. They're still here. They can tell you who I was and how serious I was against these Christians. He said, after I received a letter from them, from, from these count, the council, the le Jewish leaders, the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to arrest those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. He went to Damascus to find Christians, to arrest them, to bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. That's what he was doing. That's the life he lived. That was his story. And that's how it started. His zeal was so great for following God that he went against anybody who was opposed to it. And Gamaliel, his, his, the guy who instructed him and taught him, was more tolerant than Paul was. Gamaliel, back in Acts 5, says, listen, we, we, we better uh, calm it down a little bit because if this is not of God, it'll go away. This Christian movement, this, this, these followers of Jesus, if it's not of God, it will go away. And here we are 2,000 years, and it hasn't gone away 2,000 years later, right? But if this, if this is of God, nothing you can do can stop it. That's what Gamaliel said. And Paul's like, I'm going to go stop it. I'm going to go arrest these people and bring them, and I'm stopping it myself. And so he was zealous, more so than the most religious people of his time, to, to serve God in the way that he thought he should. And he knew, Paul knew the Christian faith was different than anything else he had seen. He knew it was a genuine threat to his way of life, because not, not because these people were going to attack him physically, but because of what they believed. They believed in a different God than he believed in. A, a God that was fundamentally the same but different from what he knew. He knew that Jesus had claimed in John 14 that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so what that meant was if Paul doesn't follow Jesus, he can't get to the Father. He can't get to the God he, that he's been worshiping with his life. And so Paul knew, hey, these things can't be true, both be true. They are opposed to each other. And Paul knew Christianity was completely different. It wasn't about law-keeping or earning his own way to heaven, being a good Jew, being a good person. It wasn't about any of that. It was the opposite. It was all about Jesus and what he had done and his merit that he gives to others. His perfect life that he says, I'll, t I'll give you my perfect life and I'll take your sins on myself and, and pay your punishment. It's all about Jesus and what he did and freely receiving his salvation, what he accomplished on the cross.
for us. And so Paul knew, hey, listen, because Christianity is completely different and Jesus is the only way, it means that Paul's religion is, is false. And he's, he says, nope, either I'm right or they're right. And I'm going to think I'm right, so I'm going to go attack them. And I'm going to get rid of them because I'm convinced my way is right. That's Paul's story. He was convinced. Peter made it very clear when he spoke to the Jews in Acts 4. He said, of Christ, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Paul knew that. That's what they were teaching. And that was exclusive to him. And so he says in verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. It was a threat. And Paul was ruthless in that. He wanted to destroy Christianity and it was known. Verse 5, it says he went to Damascus with a mission from the leaders to bring them back. But it never happened. God interrupted his life. And this is the story of us as Christians. God has interrupted our lives if we have come to know Jesus. God has interrupted your life and you are not here by accident. And we see verse 6 and 7, bright lights flash while Saul's on the road. God blinds Paul and speaks to him from heaven. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And stunned Paul and blind, Paul says, Who are you, Lord? Who are you? And voice answers, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one that you are persecuting. This changes everything about Paul's life. His story was headed in this direction, and now it's headed in this direction. Suddenly Paul realized that the one that he hated as a false messiah, a false savior, a dead criminal, wasn't dead at all. He was alive. And he was the Christ. He was the savior that he needed. And God is speaking directly to him from heaven. Could you imagine that? If you're a Christian, you can imagine that because God has spoken that truth to your heart and you know it. Verse 9 through 13, others saw that light, but they didn't hear the voice. And so there was witnesses. Hey, something happened here. We don't know what's going on, but Paul's blind now and there's a light. So there's witnesses. Paul is sent to Damascus. He finds Ananias. Ananias heals him through God's power, prays over him. God brings his sight back. And so God is guiding Paul's step. He's rewriting his story. And then in verse 14, it said, he said, The God of our ancestors has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the words from his mouth. This is what God tells Paul. And so there was nothing in Paul's conversion that he could take credit for, but there was nothing in Paul's conversion that would support the charge of him being anti-Jewish, anti-this crowd, against the law, against the traditions. It wasn't about Paul. It was about Jesus interrupting Paul's life and helping him see clearly. Showing him to who God truly was and bringing him to a knowledge of the true God where God lived in him. And friends, if this is what Jesus is offering to each one of us, a, a way to see God rightly, to know him, to have him live in your life and to let him change your life. And Paul came to see he didn't really know God at all. He knew about God, or he thought he did, but he didn't know the true God. And how many of us, either at some point in our life or maybe here today, we think we know about God, but we don't really know God. Or in our past life, we, we thought we knew about God, and then God showed us the truth, who he was in Christ. In beholding the righteous one, it says that Paul beheld the righteous one. Paul now knew himself to be unrighteous. He wasn't a good enough law keeper. He had sin in his life that he had to answer to God for. And he had come to see that his own religious achievements were worthless and in need of cleansing. It wasn't about what he had been doing. He was in need of a, a perfectly righteous one. He came face to face with the holy God and realized he was unholy. He was unholy. That's all of us. And Saul of Tarsus discovered that he was a sinner in need of a Savior, and that righteousness that he needed was only found in Jesus. 
the risen Savior, the perfect Son of God. And now, because he knew his need for Jesus and Jesus' great mercy on him, he would intervene in his life. He broke through while he was blind. God made Paul new. He put his faith in Christ and God made him new. Friend, God, friends, God wants to make you new wherever you are today. He was a new creation in Christ. And this conviction, this story that Paul knew and remembered, that gave him courage. It gave him courage to stand before this crowd and know God can do that in their life right now. He could blind this whole crowd and reveal to them that they needed a Savior as much as they hated him. And it gave him a courage that would be contagious. Wow, what has happened to this guy? He is not who he used to be. He was one of us, and now he's not. Something happened. It makes you stop and think. And for those of us today who have been saved by Christ, we have to remember who we once were. We have to tell our story of who we would still be without God's grace coming to us. And this is how we live for courage, with courage for Christ. We remember what God has done. When we think too highly of ourselves or we're tempted to think too highly of ourselves, our own egos, we get bent out of shape when others talk about us or do something that offends us. We think we deserve something better than what we get. We should remember that it is only by the grace of God that we are where we are now. We have no righteousness of our own. We deserve nothing from Him. We have offended a holy God with our sin. And yet he freely offers us grace and mercy. We are all sinful people in need of a perfectly righteous Savior. You need that today. We all do. To bring us to God and to make us new and see how Jesus came and did that for us. We constantly need to be reminded of just how amazing grace is. We lose sight of that. We can sing it. We can sing Amazing Grace but we forget how amazing it is that God would do that for us. And as we are reminded that we can never boast in ourselves, we can have courage to boast in the gospel of Jesus Christ who saved us. We can never boast in ourselves, but he's worth boasting in. He's worth speaking about. And so we have a contagious courage when we know Christ, when we know what he's done. And it's personal because we knew we needed him, and he came to us, and he showed us who he was, and we love him. So we aren't living for ourselves, and we are now living for him. That's courage. Then we see a third way that we can have a con con contagious courage, and that is by prioritizing the calling that he's put on our lives. Not missing the fact that God didn't just save us to sit there, but God saved us to call us to go. And when we remember that, we prioritize that, we can live courageously for him. Paul could have courage because he knew God had called him to, th to this very moment of speaking to people about who Christ truly was. If you knew today, if you came in here today and God supernaturally spoke to you and said, hey, walk across uh, the street, down a few houses, knock on the door, talk to those people, tell them who you are, tell them about how Jesus loves them, pray for them. You knew God had told you specifically to do that. You would do it, right? I would think you would have courage, and God would say, hey, listen, I'm going to go with you as you do that. It's not just you. I'm with you. I'm right there with you. I'm going to go with you. You knock on that door and talk to those people. You would have courage to do that. That's what happened to Paul. Right? God told him, hey, I'm going to call you to a specific thing, and I'm going to be with you. Look at verse 15. He, he, here's what happened to Paul's conversion. God says this, you will be a witness for him to all people of what you have seen and heard. In 16, and now, why are you delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So keep moving forward, Paul. You're going to be called to go to all these people. Take the steps, right? Put your faith in Christ, publicly profess it through baptism. Your, your sins will be made clean as you trust in Christ. He, he forgives your sin. God offers to forgive our sin like that. Call on his name and you will be a witness to all these people to tell your story. God had appointed him to know his will 
to see and hear the righteous one, to know God, to be a witness to all men. And what he's saying, there's all types of people, right? Paul would be a witness to kings and servants, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile, all these different types of people God was calling Paul to tell the story about. And that's going to be Paul's ministry. His ministry was broad, all types of people. In verse 17 through 21, we hear Paul tell the story of how he goes to Jerusalem. He goes in the temple, and God gives him a vision of going to these people. And for a Jewish audience, this would be huge. He didn't tell this, this vision story, and the other time he recounts his conversion, but he tells it to this Jewish crowd because for Jews... Hearing about somebody who has a vision with God in it brings back reminders of the Old Testament. They had seen God come in visions to previous people. Specifically, you think of Isaiah. God came to Isaiah in a vision. And so when when Paul talks about having a vision for God, the Jewish people think, this is holy ground right here. God, God is in this. Visions back up God's work. And so God is using Paul to speak to these people and say, listen, God has given me a calling. He's changed me. And in the vision, God tells him to leave Jerusalem because they would not believe him. And here he is back in Jerusalem. Verse 21, he said to me, go because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. In other words, people that don't live in Israel. I'm talking about Europe and Asia and places like that, right? So Paul's association with the Gentiles, with these other people, is what got him in trouble to begin with. That's why he was arrested. The Jewish people said, hey, these people don't belong here, and Paul's bringing them in, but Paul really wasn't. It was a false accusation, but that's what stirred him up, and here he is bringing them back into the equation. At this point, things go downhill in a hurry, all right? They don't want to hear any more from Paul, and we're going to see that next week. There's a violent response to Paul even mentioning non-Jewish people being a part of God's plan. But Paul knew his calling. He wasn't afraid to say it because he knew that God had called him to it. Even though he knew these people were going to hate him for it, he could still say it. When we know a calling that God has put on our life, we can do it no matter how hard it's going to be. When we know, without a shadow of a doubt, that God has called us to something, we can do it. Because we know He is in that. And when God is in that, it doesn't matter what's against us, it's going to succeed. God is going to accomplish His purposes. And just as Paul knew that he had a specific calling on his life, listen, if you are a Christian, God has given you a specific calling. Every single one of you as a Christian has a calling. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. And I will be with you. God has promised he will be with. Just like if God was going to come in a vision and tell you to go three houses down and knock on a door, that he was going to be with you, you would do it. God's already promised he's going to be with you. He's already told you that. Why aren't we doing it? Do we not believe he is with us? Are we scared because we've forgotten that he's with us? And just as Paul knew his calling, we have a calling. We can learn from Paul's calling. He knew his assignment was to proclaim the good news. That's our job. We are not responsible for the results, but we are responsible for sharing it. It's a calling. And sometimes people may not like our message. They may not like to hear about Jesus and the call that he's put on their life. Sometimes people will hear and inquire for more. They'll be interested. Sometimes people will stop right there and be arrested by what God has done for them and the forgiveness he offers to them, and they will surrender their life to him. But we all, no matter who responds and how they respond, we must always remember that nobody is beyond the reach of God's sovereign converting grace. Right? And he is with us. And he is with his word. And as Peter says, we must always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us. So we last year did something called Who's Your One, 
where we were trying to intentionally pray for a person in our life that God had put in our life already, try to find ways to speak to them and share with them and love them, point them to Christ. We're going to do that again uh, in the next month or so. And so we'll be putting out some more information about that. But that's just a way that we can realize, listen, we are responsible for the people that God has put in our life. Like, we never know if they're even going to be here tomorrow. And we don't want to be found before a holy God who has given us a calling unfulfilled. All right, we, we, this is an urgent task, and we must be ready. And you can have that same confident courage that Paul did, knowing that God has called you. That God called you to himself and then call, called you to go out with him. With him. So God gives the call, and he will accomplish those purposes in us. We must simply trust in him. Paul met, Damascus, met Jesus on this Damascus road, and it completely changed his story. God wrote a beautiful story of faithfulness and power that, that he would use Paul in all these people's lives. And Paul lived it in such a way that he loved people. He met them where they were. It was contagious because... They saw the change in him and his care for them. He wanted others to see what he had found. He wanted others to see his love for Christ and his passion for Christ. This is what it looks like to know Jesus, to really know Jesus. That's what it looks like. We want others to have it. Let every person here today who claims the name of Christ be empowered to share with this kind of courage. Every one of us. Our Savior is mighty and our task is urgent. We have no excuse to not be courageous. If you aren't sure today, if you are a Christian, if you've not had an experience like Paul where God changed your understanding of who he was, showed you how much he loved you and cared for you and sent his son for you to die on a cross for your sin, If you're not sure about that, God wants to change your life just like he changed Paul's. He wants your life to look like Paul's, wherever you are today. And God has the power to do that in you. But you must simply first acknowledge you need that. That your life by itself cannot stand before God. But God offers to make you new. He offered to send Christ to be the Savior that you need. And he offers you a new life with him. If you rebel against that fact, you are no different than this mob that that Paul's talking to. That wants to do it themselves. That wants to keep doing what they've been doing. And saying that our way is best. What I'm doing right now is best. God's way is not best. No matter what the Bible says. My way is best. If that's you, you're no different than that crowd. But God is calling you to know that his way is best. And his way is Christ in you. So today, may God give us grace to embrace Jesus and to live for him wholeheartedly with contagious courage. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you did in Paul's life. Lord, how you used Paul in the early days of the church to spread the good news of what you've done. But God, we don't stop there. We don't just thank you for what you did in Paul's life. Because, Father, if we know Christ, you have done the same in us. God, may we be overwhelmed with gratitude and love for you because of your grace in changing our story. When we are on a path of darkness, a path of Hopelessness, a path that we didn't know where it ended. Father, that you saw fit to break through into our lives, to open our eyes to the beauty of who you are, to love you in a new way, to invite you to to rule our lives. Father, you did all that. God, I pray today, if there is anybody here who does not know that, who does not know you, that you would put it in their hearts to seek you, and that they would find you. Lord, help us to be serious about being courageous to help others find you. Through your power, by your word, by your spirit working. God, there is fullness of joy in your presence 
May we experience that joy in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.